<clears throat> Song of the Whale The Lives of Baleen Whales The baleen whales are extremes among animals. Some, like the fin whale, strike most of us as extremely beautiful. In contrast, the physical form of the grey whale is an acquired taste. Their most arresting feature, though, is their size. The blue whale, at 26 meters long and 105 metric tons, is the largest animal that has ever lived. Adults of all the baleen whale species, except the 6 meter pygmy rites, are as big as the largest land animal the African elephant, and most are much larger. Their baleen, a unique adaptation for filtering food from the water, allows extraordinary feats of feeding. While whale sharks use gill rakers and crab eater seals have specially adapted teeth to sieve prey, neither system has the flexibility or utility of baleen. These whales use their baleen filters in several ways. Blue, fin, mink, and humpback whales lunge feed. Approaching a school of prey, they accelerate and then, just as they reach the school, they open their mouths by dropping their lower jaws. The pressure of the water on the lower jaw balloons out their pleated throats, breaking the momentum of the whale and engulfing a huge volume of water and prey. The whale, now nearly stopped, closes its mouth around this potential bonanza. However, the mouth is not quite closed, so that water is squeezed out through the baleen plates while the prey is trapped inside the mouth. One gulp of a fin whale may contain 60 to 80 metric tons of water and food more than the volume of its whole body. The food may be almost any schooling marine creature, including krill, herring, mackerel, capelin, or squid. Lunch feeding is an exceptionally efficient way of feeding on schooling prey, which individually may be anywhere from half a centimeter to half a meter long. Lunge feeding by humpback whales and almost certainly the other lunging baleens comes in many variants. It can be done fast or slow, at the surface or at depth, singly or communally, and with or without bubbles, tail slaps, or sounds. The other major feed, sorry. The other major feeding method of the baleen whales is skim feeding the preferred method of right and bowhead whales. The animals swim steadily along with their mouths partially open. Water enters at the front and leaves through the baleen at the sides, with food being caught on the mesh formed by the baleen. Skim feeders have finer, longer baleen than the lunch feeders. The baleen plates of bowhead whales can be over 4 meters in length and the pronounced arc of the mouth needed to accommodate this large filter gave the bowhead its name. These whales generally catch smaller prey, for instance copepods, just a few millimeters long, are a favorite food of right whales. In another innovative use of baleen, grey whales swim along the bottom of, on their right sides sucking sediment through their short coarse baleen to filter out amphipods and other benthic creatures. These are all exceptionally efficient ways of making a living in the ocean, especially in productive areas where the prey schools are common and dense. As bog feeders, the baleen whales need dense aggregations of prey, but when they get them, life is good. As big animals, they can store the energy from this bounty in their blubber. This permits another remarkable characteristic of the baleen whales, their ocean-spanning migrations. For most baleen whales, life is highly seasonal. Generally, the summer isn't for feeding, and the winter is for breeding. 
Summer is spent in temperate or arctic waters and winter in or near the tropics. Why? Good question. Spending the summer in temperate or polar waters is easy to explain. That's where the food is. The waters there are just more productive. But then why spend all the energy migrating to the tropics and even worse, fasting half the year instead of sticking where the food is, sucking up all the calories and pumping out more calves? The default answer here is that warmer, calmer waters are better for calf survival. But this is a hard idea to test directly. And theoretical analysis analyses are somewhat equivocal. Also, plenty of small toothed whales seem to do just fine in high latitudes all year round. Another related suggestion is that they migrate to avoid killer whale pred predation on vulnerable calves. Killer whales are much more common in the high latitudes, creating what can be called a mobility refuge. There are exceptions. The tropical brides whales don't seem to migrate much, and the arctic bowhead whales, although they do migrate seasonally, never go near the tropics. Even within species, the general seasonal migrations do not always hold. Humpback whales are the archetypal typical migrating whale. They retain the distance record for a migrating mammal, with some humpbacks feeding during the southern summer around the Antarctic Peninsula but spending their winters off Costa Rica. 8,300 kilometers to the north and the other side of the equator. However, there are humpbacks off the Arabian Peninsula that do not make any substantial seasonal migrations as their habitat naturally changes with the monsoons. The Arabian Sea becomes productive in the summer months with southwest monsoon winds, inducing upwelling of nutrients, leading to plankton blooms and dense patches of food for the humpbacks to feed on. The same waters are relatively barren in the winter when the winds blow from the north, and the humpbacks use this time for breeding. Other northern hemisphere humpbacks have roughly the same schedule, feeding from about May to October and breeding in the winter months, but they make substantial migrations between feeding and breeding areas. It is not just humpbacks. Grey whales in the North Pacific move between the Bering Sea and lagoons of the west coast of Baja, California, Mexico. Right whales in the Northwest Atlantic feed in the Gulf of Maine during the summer and give birth off Florida in winter. Blue whales move seasonally between the waters of Alaska and Central America, tracking peaks in prey abundance. While summer is feeding time for all baleen whales, there are two rather different ways of spending the winter. Humpback, grey and right whales generally congregate during winter in well-defined locations, some of which have become famous as whale watching destinations. San Ignacio Lagoon in Mexico for greys. Ma Maui for humpbacks and Hermanus, South Africa for southern right whales. The waters are shallow and clear, indicating, indicating little phytoplankton and ocean productivity, and there are lots of whales. Because of the density of whales and scarcity of other life, the whales have little to feed on, and it seems that most animals fast through the winter months even though they are active. Females give birth, while males compete for mates physically and acoustically. During these months, they live off the blubber reserves built up during the previous summer. These are fat whales, especially at the start of their winter fast. In contrast, the rorqu whales, blue, fin, say, brides, and mink whales, are slim, wonderfully sleek, streamlined creatures. Apart from the tropical brides whale, most rorqu whales, like the fat whales, migrate seasonally to warmer waters. However, unlike the fat whales, the rorqu whales do not seem to gather in winter in traditional breeding areas. Their winter migrations seem less determined, although we know rather little about where or how the rorquals spend their winters. The information that has been gathered suggests broad wintering grounds within which they wander. <laughs>